name is Jim Ellers. I'm the Senior Director of the Office of Gift Planning. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our second virtual uh, event sponsored by the Office of Gift Planning. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the Assistant Vice Provost and Director for the Center for Teaching, Learning and Outreach, Cassandra Horry. I'm going to say a little bit about Dr. Horry first. She holds a BA in Physics from the University of Colorado at Boulder and a PhD in Earth and Planetary Sciences with a focus on atmospheric chemistry and biosphere atmosphere exchange from Harvard. Her articles and talks in the field of educational development have addressed topics ranging from student writing in the sciences to learner-centered teaching and educational technology. She currently serves on the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Roundtable on Systematic change in undergraduate STEM education. And now I would like to invite Cassandra Corey to join me on the screen. Thank you so much, Jim. It's great to be here with all of you this evening. I have a few slides to share, so let me get that up on the screen. So um, the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Outreach has been around since 2012, and I'm just delighted to share a little bit more with you about it and how our work has contributed and will hopefully continue to contribute to um, educational excellence at Caltech. So when we started the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Outreach in 2012, uh, we really had a, a, a unique vision for what this center could be. Um, we recognized that when Caltech faculty and students advance their knowledge about teaching practice and the research on how education works. It has the potential to apply both to teaching at Caltech, so that's our undergraduate and our graduate courses at the university level, and also to the work that Caltech does in partnership with K through 12 schools and teachers. So that's the part of our work that's engaging really the next generations of younger students um, and their curiosity and interest in science, engineering, and mathematics. So that's why we established the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Outreach as a one-stop shop, one umbrella organization, really for anything related to teaching and education at Caltech. And I think we've um, really been pleased to see that play out in powerful ways, which I'll share more about momentarily. So in the eight and a half years or so since we started, um, I'm just delighted to be able to share that CTLO has become a model for similar centers and programs nationally. So our vision is really simple um, for teaching and educational excellence to really parallel the, the renowned research excellence at Caltech. We have that ability and potential and we're working toward it. Uh, we do so, our mission is, is to work toward that vision by supporting teachers, instruction, um, enhancing learning and facilitating that educational outreach work with the K through 12 community and we are very committed to advancing what we call evidence-based in, and inclusive teaching practices, right? Ones where the research has been done and we really have a solid understanding of how those practices work for students, for learners, and for teachers. Um, and we are really delighted to get to foster innovation based on that foundation. So just to bring this home, I'd love, like to share a quote from President Thomas Rosenbaum at Caltech. I really like this way of thinking about what we do. The best teaching and outreach create moments of discovery when both teachers and students find new ways to realize their talents and ambitions. Caltech aims to create those turning points. And I like that idea of a turning point because I think maybe it evokes and brings each of us back to a time when 
we had an aha moment sometime in our childhood, in our education, um, in our life. And that is a, a non-reversible process. Once that spark has happened, that turning point, we open up new possibilities. And it doesn't matter if the, the person who's having that spark um, is an elementary student, as you'll, you'll hear some examples of a little bit later this evening, um, whether it's an undergraduate, a graduate student, or really the teacher themselves um, as the process of teaching is one where frankly we are always learning more. So the center um, has had some unique impacts at Caltech. This graph simply shows the services that the center has provided um, each year of the first five years of our operations. And you can see this tremendous growth over that period. I will say after that, thankfully, we've leveled off to more of a steady state. Um, but this represents all kinds of work that we do, individual consultations. So we'll sit down with instructors instructors, whether it's in person or online, and, and talk through their goals for teaching, the strategies that they're going to use, workshops, courses on teaching. I'm starting my spring course next week with a group of about 20 graduate students all about teaching in the sciences and, and participation in educational outreach, along with kind of campus-wide events that get the whole community talking about our educational goals. CTLO has now worked with um, nearly all Caltech faculty, and each year we work with um, between a half to a third of, of the Caltech professors um, at all career stages across all disciplines. And that engagement uh, relative to our institution size is, is frankly the highest that I've been able to find um, among our peer and other institutions. Um, and this chart really only shows Caltech engagement, right, by members of our own community. But the reach through the programs with the K through 12 community in partnerships with our local public schools, our elementary, middle, and high schools, it's actually in the tens of thousands per year. So there's a lot going on, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to share that impact with you. Um, we've also seen impacts on the culture of teaching and the climate for inclusion and equity at Caltech. We have a long way to go in these areas, but we're making progress. Um, it's a really significant shift for Caltech to have packed events, whether they're online or in person, you see these, you know, kind of exciting um, sessions and discussions happening in some of the photos here about teaching. Um, we see faculty undertaking really exciting educational experiments in their courses, and that contributes to kind of a buzz, um, a sense of excitement about trying new methods of teaching, like active learning, like using some new technologies in smart ways. And those practices in classes um, actually have the potential and do increase inclusion and equity for Caltech students. Um, by making it possible really for students, no matter what their background or their propensity to um, uh, participate in class or, or any biases that they have experienced in the past, to have that opportunity to engage and learn um, while they're with their peers and with their professors. Those are also the foundations for our, our long-term and, and I think really profound collaborations with local and regional K through 12 schools. Um, we do tend to work with schools and districts which um, are present in the Pasadena area where students are mostly coming from lower income households and demographic backgrounds that have historically been marginalized or underrepresented in the science, um, engineering and mathematics fields. And that work in turn gives um, Caltech students who engage with it the opportunity to um, not only give back, but be, be part of our larger community to develop their own communication skills, um, but also to really find meaning in their work is there is really nothing like having one's research um, kind of open those doors and, and light up possibilities for someone who might become a scientist or engineer in the future. And finally, in terms of that goal for innovation and excellence, um, you know, those many small changes that we see instructors making that we see happening across campus, those scale up um, to 
increased Caltech's reputation. It's contributed to our initial appearance um, last year and rise on this list of national um, institutions with best undergraduate teaching, uh, and also a recognition of Caltech's um, dedication to teaching that we see during the admissions process and just to this overall kind of campus climate for innovation in teaching. Now, some of you might be aware that we had a pretty major pivot, not only at Caltech, but across higher education to move online during the COVID-19 pandemic. So in spring 2020, we moved all Caltech courses online in about a two week period. And um, not to get too far into the details, but this chart just shows from spring, um, spring 2018, winter 2019, spring 2019, fall 2020, winter 2020 last year, the very end of it, um, we started to move completely online. And, and this is a platform that shows the number of assignment submissions to an online platform that lets um, in, uh, teach, uh, students, my apologies, students submit their work all electronically, and then gives the instructors and teaching assistants a way to give students really rapid and effective feedback on their work, also privately and electronically electronically and then have access to their grades to be able to you know calculate that for the class so you can see that tremendous growth in use of just this one of several different tools and then that growth has sustained and I wanted to point this one out because it's one of the places where I don't think we are going back I don't think we are going back to having um, very many physical drop boxes where students have to walk across campus sometimes late at night to hand in a paper assignment um, into a slot in a mailbox on the wall um, because this is is just so much um, easier and and it gets gets students the feedback um, just much more effectively. Um, we also then as we moved into summer last year. Um, we worked to um, engage with the faculty right that first transition was so quick, but then we were able to take a little bit more time over the summer to prepare for the fall. And um, so we worked in conjunction with all the divisions and the faculty to launch what we called the Caltech Adaptable Teaching Series. Uh, we had some 15 different sessions from how-to sessions to discussions to workshops, 130 faculty participated um, to really think about how they wanted to approach this challenge of online teaching for the coming year. And so the one that shown here uh, was a discussion about connection and communication in remote and online classes, right? How do you create a sense of presence when you are never going to see your students in person? And um, we were lucky to have our wonderful faculty colleagues sharing what they had done and looking at some of the research that's been done elsewhere. And then um, we also worked to enhance our technology platforms for this academic year. We were able to implement a new, what's called a learning management system, Canvas for the campus and integrate that fully with our student information systems. Um, now we have this kind of portal where students can log in and find all of their classes um, listed right there, anything that they're enrolled in, it gets updated hourly if they drop or add classes. And faculty can um, use a whole variety of, of plug-in specialized tools for teaching, or they can use a very kind of simple streamlined platform if that's what they prefer. So lots of flexibility, lots of room continuing for innovation and for us to grow that platform. And when we implemented this, I remember one faculty colleague um, said, Said, wow, this is a game changer for Caltech's technology um, and educational infrastructure. And then looking ahead, I will say, you know, we're starting to have that conversation about, well, what have we learned? What kind of positive changes should we be retaining after this experience? And in fact, we asked that question in a faculty survey um, this winter, and we got some very, very thoughtful, um, really insightful responses. Um, so one, although uh, I, this, this faculty member misses interacting with students. Of course, we want to be in the classroom. Um, they also felt like that challenge, almost the constraints of it, forced them to improve the content, improve the materials, improve how they interacted with students, and they plan to 
uh, retain a lot of those changes. Um, just another example, um, wow, they found that in this online environment, they really needed to be even clearer about their expectations and think about how to engage students through this new platform. And then they're planning to bring a lot of those methods, you know, back into the um, physical environment and even augment that in-person experience. Um, and even more, you know, we have a lot of interaction at Caltech, um, given our small environment, but we heard faculty saying that they plan to have, you know, more student led aspects of courses, um, explorations and discussions. Um, and we'll share a link with you, but um, our Office of Strategic Communications has just done a phenomenal job of um, sharing these stories about particular courses and, and innovations that have happened during this remarkable time. Um, so, you know, just a few examples here, um, and you'll be able to, we'll share this in the chat, and you'll be able to explore these um, later on. But one of the courses, the one that says the course that teaches teachers, it's biology 23, it's one where grad students and postdocs design and teach a very special topic seminar that they're interested in. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the graduate students taught a course called At the Intersection of Biology and Race, following up on this year's um, really remarkable engagement in the Black Lives Matter movement with a scientific lens. Um, another taught a cutting edge course on um, optogenic approaches in neuroscience, right, really leading edge. Um, and our undergraduates had access to that topic and our, our postdoc in that case got a chance to teach their own course start to finish. Um, another of these examples um, is about Adam Blank, um, an assistant teaching professor in computer science who really transformed small group and office hours interactions for the online environment. Great to read more about that. And the last example I'll share here is of an assistant professor in um, the computing and mathematical science area, Katie Bellman, um, who uh, it's the one in the lower left hand corner teaching imaging techniques with Raspberry Pi and Scotch tape. Um, so you might remember um, Professor Bellman, who uh, was uh, very well known for producing the very first image being part of a large science team to produce the first image of a black hole that anyone had ever had uh, in 2019. And so this course for Caltech students um, involved building physical kits of the raw materials of Raspberry Pi is a very simple programmable, pro programmable, customizable computer platform and mailing them out to students with optical elements so that students could explore this kind of digital imaging um, field, which is, is growing rapidly. So constraints have led to innovations. And I just wanna know uh, uh, the last bit here that um, faculty have also been really deeply engaged in our work with the K through 12 community. And I share here a quote from um, Nick Hutzler, who is an assistant professor of physics and also a Caltech alum um, about you know, this belief. A lot of people are interested in science, but so often it's presented in a way that's opaque. It's worthwhile not only to speak of the fundamental questions we're trying to answer, but also to show the process. Scientists are thoughtful, precise, and thorough. Um, and so uh, Nick and his lab are, are very much engaged with the K through 12 community. Um, they host high school students doing research with Caltech with their lab during the summer. That's not what's shown here. This is a younger student participating in an educational outreach event with Nick's lab. Um, but we've just really been impressed with not only Nick's commitment, but other faculty similarly who encourage graduate students to mentor undergraduates, high school researchers, and really view that as a, an important part of their development as future scientists and leaders. And I'll also note that this work with the K through 12 students was a part of a proposal to the National Science Foundation from Nick um, and was therefore a contributing factor in um, receiving a, a really coveted early career um, research grant from the National Science Foundation. So that hopefully gives you a little bit of an overview of what's been happening with the Center for Teaching, Learning and Outreach. And um, in just a moment, I uh, will be delighted to introduce our 
other two panelists who are students at Caltech. Um, so I'll invite them in just a moment. I'll tell you a little bit about them first. Um, Ida Bamard is a PhD candidate in planetary science whose interests in um, to span a whole range from the chemistry of star and planet formation, stellar astrophysics, planet demographics, and exoplanets. And um, she's active in our educational outreach through a program called the Visiting Scientists, among other graduate leadership roles that she has held at Caltech, and she'll share more about, about that in a few moments. And Daniel Niamati is a senior undergraduate majoring in mechanical engineering with a minor in planetary science, actually. And he was an intern at JPL in 2018-19, actually working on the sample tubes for the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover that just touched down. Uh, he's also served as a teaching assistant in mechanical engineering and worked on several student committees with the CTLO. Um, and now I will stop sharing my screen and invite Ida and Daniel to join me. Great, thank you so much. Um, so first I would like to turn it over to Ida to share more about her experience working with the Visiting Scientist Program and a little bit more about herself and her work with Caltech. Yeah, sure, thanks for the introduction, Cassandra. Um, so as Cassandra mentioned, I am a graduate student in planetary science, and um, I've always had a very deep interest in science outreach, uh, particularly for the K through 12 level. Um, and when I came to Caltech, I was very interested in getting involved in some way. And I feel like I'm very lucky because CTLO exists here. And um, this is just an excellent organization that offers the visiting science, visiting scientist program, which I'm a part of. Um, and I've basically been uh, volunteering through this program for the past four years since I came here as a graduate student. Um, and this is something that I'm not sure uh, a lot of people know, but even though Pasadena is like a particularly affluent area, the actual Pasadena Unified School District, the public schools are actually very underserved and disenfranchised. Um, and so having this visiting scientist program that allows us to go into these schools that mainly serve uh, uh, students from families that are low, lower socioeconomic statuses and um, often come from like black and Latino households uh, is like really rewarding in general because I feel like it allows me to think about not only how does one conduct scientific outreach, you know, in terms of teaching methods and that sort of thing, but also, you know, who do you want to reach with your scientific outreach and why. So it's really uh, allowed me to think more deeply about those uh, sorts of topics. And I feel like it's kind of really helped me in my development as a scientist. Ida, would you like me to show the page of images and talk a little bit about those? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, okay, let's see. Some of these are quite old. So the one where I'm uh, holding up a violin on the, uh, the, the left-hand side is when we were doing a unit on uh, sound waves with the students and I teach K through two. So um, we tend to like uh, cover a broad range of scientific topics, but we adhere to the Pasadena Unified School curricula. So we don't get like too in depth on like the physics of like waves, but we did allow them to kind of like uh, visualize what a sound wave looks like. So you can kind of see um, Cecilia in the back. She's my colleague, uh, graduate student in geobiology who I work with and she's kind of drawn a a representation of a sound wave on the whiteboard um, and the kids were like plucking the strings of my violin and we had it like uh, um, also hooked up to an oscilloscope so you could actually see the waves as they were plucking the strings. so that was pretty fun um, and then let's see the photo on the upper right where they have like a big slinky I think that was taken on the same day when we were doing um, waves so that was when we were trying to demonstrate longitudinal waves, which is like what a sound wave is like, as opposed to like a, a transverse wave. And that has to do with like direction of propagation versus, uh, um, yeah. So anyway, I won't get too much into the science, but they definitely had fun with the demonstration. Uh, and then let's see. So we've transitioned of course to Zoom lessons since quarantine started. And um, this has been a bit challenging, but it's also been also pretty rewarding because it kind of allows us to modify our lessons in a way that uh, maybe is like a little bit different for the remote learning. And I think somehow sometimes this like allows us to incorporate different things. Like we can incorporate videos more often in our lessons. Um, so here I've uh, actually um, filmed a short lesson for the students on the order of the planets in the solar system. And this was for our first graders. So you can see I'm kind of just like demonstrating where each of them 
lie um, in their orbits, not to scale, of course, but just so they can get the idea. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think on the, let's see, the lower right hand, um, another one of our volunteers is showing them how to simulate a, uh, a landslide. So this was our earth processes unit. They really liked that because they got to get messy with the dirt. Um, yeah. Great, thank you so much, Ida, and um, sharing those experiences. And you get a, a taste a little bit of um, what it's like to both be in person with this elementary school, which is, it's not too far away from Caltech physically. It's it's right there in Pasadena. Um, it's one of the larger elementary schools and this team of visiting scientists, um, you can see how they work together to plan the lessons or working closely with the, um, with the teachers, which is really important as well, right? So this isn't just Kind of a um, swoop in and take over and then and then leave it's something that's really a part of the students experience for the whole year yeah exactly so um with that we'll shift a little bit over to think about undergraduate education um, with some experiences from daniel yeah thank you so much and uh, thank you everyone for joining us here today um so through my now four years at caltech I've had the opportunity to work both as a teaching assistant, but then uh, also in the leadership team for some of the uh, undergraduate academic activities that we do on campus. So first starting with the teaching assistant side, uh, when I was a sophomore, uh, I was taking sort of what's called the mechanical engineering core courses. So we cover mechanics and uh, thermodynamics. And I had, you know, fantastic TAs. Uh, that were able to sort of take what the professor was saying in class and then meet me in office hours and explain it in a different way that also adapted uh, to the ways that I was learning. Uh, and I really wanted to pass, you know, that torch along in a sense. Uh, so then when I became a junior, uh, I actually essentially made an application to become a TA for, for those classes. And fortunately, I had the opportunity to do so. Uh, and one thing that I learned really early on uh, was that you might have, you know, some some way that you want to explain the material uh, to a student, but uh, you know they're coming in from their own perspective, and working with the CTLO uh, through their you know teaching workshops and then also with more casual discussions, I sort of got a better and better feel of sort of how to meet the students uh, where they were and really engage, you know, their past experiences in order to make uh, their learning experience more fruitful. So. Uh, that continued, you know, all the way throughout my uh, teaching experience. And I think uh, when we sort of switched to virtual learning, uh, it definitely added this constraint uh, that now not only was I thinking about what material we were going to cover in office hours, uh, because of the virtual uh, environment, I also wanted to figure out, you know, which figures I might want to show, what, you know, pictures I might want to pop out on the screen so that it was easier for them to follow along my explanation. So that extra step of thinking, you know, what might I prepare uh, for my office hours, I think also made me a better teacher uh, because it made me think more critically about what I wanted to, to discuss. Then separately from that, I've been working on the leadership for what's called the Academics and Research Committee on campus. Um, and through there, I've been able to talk with the CTLO uh, quite a bit on a range of topics. Um, so that ranges from you know, academic policy uh, to making recommendations for changes that we uh, might do to adapt to the virtual environment, uh, to more casual understanding of uh, student to teacher to TA interactions. So I'm really grateful to be a part of all of that. Uh, and I think uh, we have some pictures that uh, might help demonstrate some of this as well. So here on the left, uh, you see the ARC uh, retreat. So uh, every year, uh, we sort of meet up as a team to figure out what are the key things that we want to push as a as a student group uh, in, for the next year. Uh, so this is taking a uh, big uh, big bear, and some of the things that we uh, really wanted to to look the year after this photo was taken uh, was sort of you know how does the arc sort of present itself and how can it be more engaging for students uh, to come to the arc with questions and how can we direct them to services at the CTLO or ways that they can interact with their faculty um, teachers. So one, one concrete example is that we made a, a form on the student website where they can submit a question about, you know, how should I ask a faculty about lectures being too fast? Or how should I talk to a faculty about them posting the notes uh, after class? So those are, you know, you know, services that we can help them uh, make possible. 
and oftentimes uh, to sort of respond to those concerns, we actually meet with the CTLO and we ask them about their opinion. You know, what are some strategies uh, that have worked in the past for other students? How can we sort of employ that into the future? And on the right side, uh, you see the what are called the teaching awards, uh, which we have every year. Uh, and we congratulate uh, faculty and TAs that sort of go above and beyond uh, to not only, you know, be instructors, but then also uh, be model instructors for, you know, other folk around the university. So we're really grateful to, you know, be able to choose the awards. And clearly, you know, we're doing the easy part because they're all great uh, people and we, you know, they're all doing fantastic uh, teaching, uh, but we get to highlight, you know, some of the, the key teaching um, styles and frameworks and, you know, lessons that we have around campus. So that sort of gives a, a high level overview of the things I've done. And I'm happy to, you know, answer any of questions about any of these. Thank you so much, Daniel. So you hopefully, um, those of you who are who are listening are getting a sense of a wide range of ways in which um, students are involved in, in this endeavor to, um, you know, kind of be working on and, and improving and evolving um, how we think about education at Caltech. Um, so just to engage, you know, both of you in a little bit more conversation, um, you started to to touch on, you know, what that transition was like uh, during the during the pandemic and kind of moving everything online. Um, I wondered if there's, um, you know, anything that you you noticed about the effect on students um, as well, and and kind of how those changes have have played out not only in the specific courses and programs that you worked on, um, you know, but among your your colleagues and, and friends as, as well. Yeah, sure, I can uh, speak on that a bit. So, um, so as I mentioned, I teach K through two. So I'm working with very young kids um, and classroom management was already something that I came in with like very little experience because, you know, it takes years for someone to become a experienced elementary school teacher good at classroom management. I'm nowhere near that at all. Um, and then when we transitioned to remote learning, it was sort of even more challenging because uh, it's hard to like make sure that you're reaching all of the students who are there remotely because like, you know, oftentimes there will be a couple students who are more outspoken and that's awesome, but then like it's hard to reach the quieter students. Um, and so thinking kind of carefully about how we can do that, like implementing different technological tools, like encouraging them to use the chat when they have a question, but they don't want to say it out loud, trying to keep track of like which students have spoken um, have been very helpful. And I think that like some of these methods, I think I can take back with me when we go back to in-person learning. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think, uh, I mean, a lot of teachers are being quite proactive uh, in how they're using sort of the technological capabilities. So it could be as simple as, you know, the teacher saying, uh, you know, uh, what do we think about, you know, X, uh, and then asking people to reply using, you know, the yes, no options in Zoom, uh, or, you know, you know, putting something in the chat. And I think uh, it's, it's kind of unique uh, opportunities on, on Zoom uh, because in the class, you know, sometimes people uh, don't really like raising their hand for, uh, for you know, perfectly valid reasons. And I think Zoom uh, sort, of, it sort of enables some of that, those features uh, that make it a little, bit more, a little bit easier to engage. And there are definitely lessons that we can learn, um, you know, into the future about how do we maybe use different techniques than just raising your hand uh, to solicit participation in class. Uh, and then sort of extending off of that, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, Canvas and a new learning management system, because it has been a dramatic uh, change. And I really, really enjoy the platform, uh, all the way from having a nice, easy place to access lectures, where it's consistent across, across classes, and you can download the lecture beforehand, so you can annotate the lecture. I think those are all, you know, uh, really great features and definitely features that we can take in, um, you know, past this virtual setting and, you know, back into in-person learning. 
Thank you. Yeah. And um, just coincidentally, at the same time that Caltech went to the Canvas Learning Management System, the Pasadena Unified School District also went to the Canvas Learning Management System. So we were learning to use this new platform um, kind of with our larger K through 12 community as well and went through a pretty rigorous process to choose that platform from among many with input from students, faculty, and, and our technology um, colleagues in um, our IT. Uh, uh, area called IMSS. Um, so uh, I would love to hear too, just a little bit more if you would be willing to share about how your, you know, it's not always right that in, in school you get involved in teaching. Um, it's not always the case. And so um, how has your involvement in educational endeavors, how do you think that has changed your experience at Caltech? Uh, let's see, I'll try and think of a response. That's a, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it's definitely enriched it, I would say. Um, I feel like I am more involved with like the, the local community now because I do the visiting scientist program through CTLO and that makes me feel like I, I have more to give back as a scientist and a Caltech community member. Um, and of course, I think we mentioned this, but uh, you know, a lot of the uh, teaching experiences I've had have like, I think made me a better science communicator. I think this will um, you know, just make me a more well-rounded scientist. And I think a big part of being a scientist is communicating your science to other people. If you're not doing that, then why are you doing that? So um, I'm very grateful for the experience that I've had here. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And sort of you know, going along uh, with that you know, stream, I think, you know, as scientists, we sort of almost have an obligation uh, to discuss what we're learning uh, so that it can continue not only for, you know, the people around us, but also for generations to come. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're working on has, you know, solid societal impacts, um, whether it's, you know, personally, I do research in autonomy and autonomous uh, spacecraft and aircraft, uh, and that, you know, affects day-to-day -day life, but then, um, it also directly affects other scientists. So uh, for me personally, I really enjoy uh, research uh, that sort of enables science. And I think in a lot of ways it mimics uh, what, it, what it means to be a teacher because you know, as an engineer, I can work away at you know, a certain research problem all day, uh, but at the end of the day, what I, what I really want to do uh, is to be able to you know, tell another uh, individual, whether they're a scientist or a community member, about what I'm working on and why it's important. So I think there's there's definitely, you know, that communication aspect that transcends not only our small community, but also the broader community. And I think, you know, the activities that we're doing at Caltech, whether it's outreach or teaching across, you know, undergrad or graduate schools, uh, really encapsulates what it means to be part of the scientific conversation and, you know, paving it forward, not only to the people around us, but for the future generations. Thank you. And I know that our um, the folks who have joined us today have questions. So I would like to invite Jim to join us and um, begin with the kind of Q&A and see what, what's on the minds of the folks who are participating with us today. Thanks, Cassandra. And thanks, Ida and Daniel. Um, I have to be honest. So as the person who gets to ask these questions, I have to, I have to force myself not to selfishly input my own questions. So I will start with questions from the audience first. Um, so this, this came from an alumna. Aiden Daniel, can you share with us how you balance your education and research with your extracurricular participation in CTLO's various programs? Uh, yeah, sure, I can answer that. Um... It's a little tough. I mean, uh, science is like a full-time job, so it doesn't leave much room for doing other things, but other things are, are very important for your development as a scientist and a person. And, you know, it's important to give back. That's very important for me. So I, I just try to make time, I would say, but yeah, uh, it's, it's tough. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, yeah, I think I, Daniel. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, especially the stuff that I've been doing for student leadership, I definitely, in a lot of ways, consider it as like a break from, you know, doing problem sets all day. So, you know, in a way it allows me to sort of step back, 
look at a you know a different problem than just you know solving a differential equation. Uh, and I think it's it's really uh, impactful, just not only for for you know myself, but then also like for my mental health and you know keeping me on check and uh, continuing my education to have that you know that break from the problem sets and really be able to uh, contribute to to more than just uh, you know a class. That's a, that's a really interesting statement, Daniel. Does this do, when you for both of you doing what you're doing with CTLO? Does it give you a sense of perspective and context for the work you're doing with Caltech? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would second that definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think I think it definitely allows you to see, you know, you know, you can have a direct impact uh, on someone just after a conversation. I think Cassandra really mentioned it nice and clearly with that, you know, that turning point. You never know when it's going to happen, but it happens, you know persistently throughout your your time working through CTLO. Yeah. And one of the things we know is that it is it is hard to be a student at Caltech. It's it is a, a big job already. And uh, yeah. the visiting scientists that you know you've heard Ida talk about, it's a very dedicated group um, that go, you know, are engaged every week throughout the school year with a, a particular school. So that is kind of the, um, the, the more committed and more time intensive um, range of, of those kinds of experiences. Throughout the school year, we also are doing now virtual, but also you know, we'll go back to doing in-person things like science nights um, with the, the local schools, which is kind of a one and done type of an experience. So we also have those options for graduate students who might wanna you know, just do one or two things during the year. They can work with us to develop a demonstration, think about how they're gonna engage kids and families, um, do that. And then it's not gonna be every week necessarily. You know? And then we have other folks who um, are doing this work just during the summer. So it's, it's a more contained experience, um, but we're certainly really grateful for the visiting scientists group who does commit to that, you know, kind of longer term relationship with the with the kids and teachers. Yeah, and actually, if I could kind of expand on that a bit, um, the big draw to me for the visiting scientists program was the fact that we would go in every week because a lot of universities um, that I've been at previously often had like, you know, outreach programs where you kind of like came in, you know, once every month, you know, and not really at a time scale more frequently. And uh, that's that's a little bit tough, I think, sometimes for for um, like classrooms with their their own curriculum that they need to follow. Of course, like you know, it's often a very positive thing, but sometimes it's like hard for people to you know accommodate a random lecture that like springs out of nowhere. And um, instead, by coming in every week, we really like have a chance to uh, work closely with the teachers and figure out what they think their students need because obviously they know best. And so this like really makes me feel like we're actually having a, a positive lasting impact. I know when you're interacting with students, uh, and I know these are very young, young students, uh, the K through through 12 uh, range, do you, do you identify students where you go, wow, this person could someday be a Caltech student or a PhD candidate at Caltech? Yeah, absolutely. You see sort of something that, that a certain spark for STEM that is unusual? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I try not to have favorites, but sometimes I do. <laughs> Some of those kids are just just amazingly bright. Yeah. Great. Um, let's see, there's a question for Daniel. Um, Daniel, it appears as if you have the option to download lectures ahead of time in com in combination with live lectures in Zoom in person, is that correct? Yeah, so you can, so oftentimes uh, the, the professor will uh, put the lecture slides uh, up. So you'd sort of download like a PDF uh, and then you can save it to you know, your favorite electronic device. And then uh, it's the same slides that they're using during the live lecture. Um, occasionally there are some uh, professors that will record separate uh, videos uh, from the live lectures to sort of supplement so, uh, for example, uh, I had a class that was covering, you know, experimental techniques in mechanical engineering. Uh, and, you know, because of the whole virtual thing, it's sort of hard to, you know, block away like a four hour Zoom call. 
Um, so he would do sort of the main part of the experiment during the Zoom call. And then if we wanted to you know, see a separate part, uh, sort, such as the setup, um, to sort of supplement what we were seeing in the lecture and also to help us write a report, uh, then those sort of additional educational opportunities were also, also present on the website or on the Canvas page. Yeah. And Great. if I could jump in and, and just add on a little bit, um, you know, I think it's been a real kind of dilemma or, or quandary to think about how this um, transition to, to online would work. And in the, the lingo, and, and this came in um, through, through, I just thought come through through the, the chat, but uh, the idea of, of synchronous. So we're, we're synchronous right now. We are together at the same time online um, versus asynchronous, which means that materials have been prepared, but perhaps I as a student could access those materials on my own time. If I wanna study at 3 a.m. in my local time, I can. Um, we've had students in a whole variety of time zones really across the globe during um, COVID-19. So um, that asynchronous part has actually been really important for students in some cases where it's just, you know, they're on the opposite from Pasadena local time. And so tuning in live is gonna be really disruptive to sleep and health and, and things like that. So um, we've, we've tried to be really flexible, but I think the other thing that that's done is, um, kind of ha uh, almost forced a sort of thinking about when we are live together, why are we live together? What are we gonna do that we you know, couldn't do unless we're actually interacting in some way? Um, and so I think just that thought process has been really interesting to see people go through that and, and sort of rethink. And I think that's in some cases what's led to that idea of kind of greater clarity about their courses and their teaching. Yeah, and sort of, you know, extending off of that, you know, if there is that live, live component, which basically every single class has, uh, there might be some opportunities in that live part, such as like asking a question during lecture, that you might not be able to do right if you, you know, I had a friend that was doing classes in South Korea, I have another friend that's doing classes in the UK right now. Um, so, you know, they might not be able to attend some of that lecture. So I think teachers have also been really thoughtful about what are ways that we can make sure that they do have that ability to, you know, ask that question? Is there a discussion forum, you know, that they can post a question? Maybe they, we have office hours spread out to make sure um, that they aren't at the same time every day. They're at different times so that people in different time zones can really have that equal access uh, to the educational experience. Uh, this is a question for the panel. Um, what has surprised you most about Caltech, particularly its faculty and students? Ida, is there is that one you'd like to start to answer? Yeah, sure. Let me let me think about it a bit. Um, hmm. I don't know if I was surprised by this, but I, I serve as a TA um, for like a number of classes in the planetary sciences department. And I'm always just very impressed by the um, level of like engagement that undergrads have like towards uh, their homework and their projects. So oftentimes um, the final project for a class is like something that's kind of like a mini research project, which is, you know, incredibly ambitious, I would say, but I'm always impressed by like a lot of the work that the students turn in. Um, yeah, and I would say that, again, I don't think I'm surprised by this necessarily, but I've uh, felt that as like a graduate researcher here, there's like just a, a very strong level of like collaboration. Um, so here I've, I've worked with uh, two other professors outside of my main advisor on different research projects. And it's been very um, easy to like set up those, um, those relationships. So yeah, it's been, it's been pretty nice. And Daniel, do you have thoughts about what's been surprising? Yeah, I definitely had, you know, this illusion that, you know, I, especially when you go into a class uh, where I, I've, I've been in classes where I've seen these people on like Science Channel growing up. And then you're like, wow, you know, these people are like, you know, these, you know, enormous people standing on a, you know, shining hill. And, you know, at first you're like, you know, you know, this is really intimidating, right? Cause it's like a childhood idol that's like now in front of you teaching a class. But I, I was really surprised just how approachable, you know, these instructors are. And, 
you know, regardless of what field they're in, they really care about, uh, you know, talking about, you know, the content of the lecture, but then also meeting the students and finding out what they're excited about and really, you know, driving that excitement forward. So for example, you know, this term I took a geobiology class and one of the assignments was, uh, you know, to write sort of like a mini review paper about a topic that interests us. And, you know, I was taking the class with Professor Kirschfink, who studies paleomagnetism, uh, you know, really sort of legendary work that he's doing. And, you know, we had like really frank conversations about, you know, what was interesting to me about early earth? What are some, you know, open questions that I think are interesting to explore? And I really worked with him, you know, to develop what my project was going to be. Uh, and so sort of that level of approachability where you can just, you know, have a conversation with someone that, you know, you sort of, you know, idealize for so long is, is uh, really surprising, but also really valuable. And I would just love to add my own surprises. So I, you know, I'm not a Caltech alum, as you heard in, in my introduction. And when I came for my um, job talk and my day of visits, um, first of all, I was um, I was meeting with student leaders from you know day minus many days right before starting. And so just that level of engagement of um, students with the institution, with the policies, with the practices, with, with really trying to improve things. Um, I have not experienced that really anywhere else um, that I've been. The second thing that, um, that was delightful and somewhat surprising to the degree I've never experienced before is that, you know, I think when our uh, faculty at Caltech are presented with something that's a little puzzling, um, which are challenges in terms of education can be presented that way. Um, I find that 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 they are then hooked and really want to solve that puzzle um, by experimenting in their own classes. And so, um, really, the the kind of turnaround from um, rethinking how to engage with students and how to teach um, becomes pretty self-sustaining and and that's really been a driver for the kind of educational changes that we've seen happen in a pretty short period of time it's just delightful to have that kind of sense of curiosity and and importance to the work once um, someone becomes kind of um, attuned to that possibility that they haven't thought about before Cassandra, I, I'm going to, um, in your involvement with, with the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Outreach, what are some of the other things that have, just in your time at Caltech, have been the most meaningful for you, for you uh, running the center? Yeah, great question, Jim. Um, you know, I think um, one is um, just that you know, it doesn't, it, there, there's not a pattern. There's no pattern to who cares about education at Caltech. Um, you might think that, you know, people in certain fields would um, be more interested in teaching. You might think that people at certain career stages, but in fact, no, and we've looked at the numbers for this. We keep really careful track of, of part patterns in participation, in part because we don't want to be missing anyone and we want to you know, kind of target the work that we're doing to, to, to reach and engage folks. But we just haven't found those patterns. So I think that speaks to whether it was perhaps a little bit untapped um, in, in, in prior years, um, the, the, that kind of close knit sense of, you know, if you're going to discover something, um, you can't keep it to yourself. And how do you share it with others? Uh, well, you're going to have to teach them about it. So there is this kind of baked in idea um, of, of discovery and teaching going hand in hand. Um, and I think that once given some tools and, and methods and ways to do that, and to, to also have a, a a successful experience with it because it's grounded in you know what we really understand about about learning um, then it's just the possibilities are are kind of unlimited um, so that's that's something that's really struck me great um, so I have I have a final question actually I have to be honest I'm, I'm being pinged that uh, I need I need to start to wrap it up. So I have a final question for Ida and Daniel, and, and there's some that I haven't been able to even pose. So I, I apologize to, to a number of people in the audience. But uh, the question to to Daniel and Ida is, what uh, 
what aspects of your experience with CTLO will you take on into your post Caltech lives? What, 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 what parts of, what have you learned from your involvement with CTLO that, will, that you think you're most likely to carry into the future? Um, I think I can try and answer, uh, frankly, a lot of it. Uh, I think that I've learned quite a lot from being able to have the opportunity to teach younger students regularly. Um, and I've definitely, because I come in regularly with the visiting scientist program, I, I feel like I have a much better understanding of like how a school operates and like even how a school district operates and all of the complications there. And um, I think this is actually very important to know because I do hope that uh, in my uh, further scientific career, I will be involved with K through 12 outreach uh, continuing. And I wanna make sure that I'm doing that in a way that is you know, positive and impactful. That's great. I grew up in a family of uh, K through 12 teachers, so they will all think that's very cool what you just said. And Daniel. Yeah, so uh, the next stage in my in my journey starting next year is, is graduate school. Uh, and something that I've actually been, you know, sort of looking at uh, at every of the schools that I've been interviewing at is sort of, you know, do they have something like the CTLO that would allow me um, to, you know, become a better, a better teacher, a better mentor uh, and basically allow me to do a lot of the things that I've been able to start to develop at Caltech. Um, and I think it's really made me appreciate, uh, you know, what CTLO provides uh, for us students here at Caltech. Um, and sort of those are, whether it's, um, you know, be becoming a better instructor as I continue forward or, um, you know, pursuing some of those, you know, leadership things that I've uh, done as an undergrad uh, to really look at what teaching means to different students and how to connect students and faculty together. Those are all, you know, challenges that I really want to continue uh, in my graduate school curriculum. And I'll really be taking a lot of the lessons that I learned uh, as an undergrad and working with CTLO uh, onward into the future. All right. Well, I just want to say to Ida, Daniel, and Cassandra, Thank you so much for this discussion and for educating uh, members of the Torchbearers uh, on, um, on what the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Outreach is all about. Um, it's very impressive, and I'm grateful for you to take time. Um, do you have any final words or anything before we wrap it up? All right. Well, well I would just... I would just like to say, you know, thanks, huge thanks again to Daniel and to Ida, you know, not only for joining us today, but for all of the great work that you've been doing to engage in, in education and outreach and teaching um, at Caltech. You've really, um, you've really made a difference. And um, I just wanna also thank you, Jim, and your colleagues for organizing this and for inviting us here and really to everyone who's, who's come tonight. Thank you so much, Cassandra. And thanks again to all, to all three of you. And, and Cassandra, I'm gonna echo um, your appreciation. Uh, I'd like to personally just give a shout out to Jenna Martin, Frank Bernal, and Leslie Weiner, Weiner and uh, Anya Janowski for their work on this as well. And then um, finally, I would just love to say thank you to the torchbearers of Caltech. Um, one of the neat things that we thought about when we were setting up this program, uh, Frank Bernal and I, is that when we go out to meet with torchbearers to say thank you for thinking of Caltech and your estate planning, that kind of thing, how many of you who are in the audience will talk to us about how you're involved in tutoring at a um, elementary school um, in your neighborhood, or how you're very interested in new forms of pedagogy and uh, learning. Um, so we, we certainly hoped that this presentation would, would uh, be of interest. And, I, and I, I assume it has been. I've really enjoyed myself. Um, with that said, I just want to say thank you uh, to all of the torchbearers in the audience who have thought of Caltech and their estate plans or created it split interest gifts to, such as a charitable remainder unit trust or a charitable gift annuity. Um, we are always uh, available to discuss 
uh, any of those types of arrangements, uh, you will uh, be receiving a follow-up email from us. So I just want to make you aware of that. And finally, I am wearing my torch bearers of Caltech lapel pin. And um, one thing in my eight, coming on nine years working in the plan giving program at Caltech is how supportive all of you are of the torch bearers and in wearing your, your lapel pin. So by all means, as we start to go out uh, in public a bit more as we get vaccinated and you would like to show off your appreciation for Caltech and the torchbearers, uh, you would be doing us a favor. We are happy to send you uh, one of these lapel pins. Uh, with that said, I will wish everyone a lovely evening. I know uh, if you're on the East Coast, which a couple of our folks are, it's starting to get a bit late. So again, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And I hope you found uh, this, after, this evening's presentation as meaningful as I did. Thanks again. <laughs>